current culture of the UK in regards to, to mental health? From an outsider's mm. perspective here in the United States, it looks like the UK has a little bit more attention and backlash to the harm of psychiatric diagnoses and drugs. You have Dr. Joanna Moncrief and Mark Horowitz who've been yeah. really outspoken mm-hmm. about the pseudoscience of antidepressant drugs. Uh, the BBC recently released an entire documentary on the harms of antidepressants and the tactics of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. You have Dr. James Davies, who's been very outspoken, and you have been wildly successful in bringing attention to the medicalization of, of trauma and you know, the, the oppressive system of our current like, mental health conceptualization, the psychiatric system, especially for women and girls. Is the tide changing? I think it is, actually. And I, I, I think if you would have asked me this a couple of years ago, I would have been like, no, it's a nightmare. But I'm not saying that the backlash hasn't gone away because it hasn't. And, it's, and you know, with any system that's this powerful, it's not, you know, not going to lie down and die overnight, is it? But what I notice is that I have like a quarter of a million followers and I and a lot of those are professionals, lots of them are members of the public. And about two or three years ago, I think that my arguments, um, because I can only speak really from my experience and what I see how people react to other academics and other activists, is that a few years ago, I think a lot of my arguments were going over people's heads. Like, I really feel like people were just reading them and thinking, what is she on about? What's she talking about? But now I feel like I put things up and people are going, yes, this is what I think. This is this is what I've always thought, but I've never seen anybody say it before. So I don't know exactly how that's happening. I mean, you have just named some very influential people in the UK. And I do notice that we have some very committed journalists as well that want to put these findings and these stories and these criticisms out into the general public. There's quite a lot of those people you just named as well who are very good at using social media. I utilize it very well. There's other people that do that as well. And I think that that breaks the mold for academia because it's so elitist and insular that obviously if we're going to just go, do you know what, we'll just go straight to the general public and say, hey, listen to our arguments, listen to this evidence. I wonder if that's what's changing it. I know that... um, So through Victim Focus, we train thousands and thousands of social workers and uh, police officers and psychologists every year. And we've just finished um, several large contracts, which probably amounts to about 3,000 police officers or so. And we're currently working on some more, maybe another four to 5,000 police officers. And um, we finished a contract recently. And I remember talking to Jamie on the way back and I said, they are so open-minded to anti-pathology trauma-informed policing that I didn't feel like that was difficult. Like we delivered it over a period of about seven or eight weeks. And sometimes when you're delivering that, it can be virtually mind numbing. Like you go home every night and you're knackered. You've been constantly challenged all day. People are not listening to you. They're not taking it in. But it just feels like recently, it's more that you get you get genuine questions and genuine criticisms and challenges, which is fine. You should get that in a learning environment. But you don't get the sort of blank looking at you like, what are you on about? Like people, it feels like people already are starting to understand that they're being duped. Like their trauma is valid. They're not mentally ill. Whereas a few years ago when I said that, people would just be like, what the fucking hell are you talking about? Yeah. And I do think social media is part of it. I also think there's a, a global awakening that's kind of occurring yeah. post-COVID where you realize the control of institutions and the use of media and money and how they've distorted scientific findings to fit a narrative. People are waking up and say, whoa, nothing is the way I thought it was. And I think there's this, I guess it's an openness to being able to think about things a little bit more critically. I agree with that. I think you're absolutely right. I think those observations, especially around COVID lockdowns and then the vaccine and then obviously the period past that meant that there are a lot of people that are starting to think hang on a minute are these people in power actually doing this in our best interests or not and that's people that have genuinely thought that you know have always felt that way for a long period of time that these people are acting in our best interests and that you know if the doctors say then that must be right and like you know that kind of attitude and I, I think I've seen it even in people 
like as an example we get a little bit off tangent here but like there's i've seen people that absolutely you know believed everything about covid took the vaccines absolutely wore a mask constantly did everything they were told to do and now they're looking back especially in the uk where we now know that our government was having parties they were meeting each other they were going wherever they wanted they were doing whatever they wanted there's whatsapp messages that have been leaked being like haha you know uh, this will scare the shit out of them like can't wait for this press release to come out and stuff like that and even people that genuinely believed all that stuff are looking at that and thinking what you know like that it gives them like you say like this space to enter into critical thinking that maybe they they weren't ready for yet or whatever it is but i also agree with this like i'm watching this global awakening there is a lot of people waking up to a lot of stuff um and i think that ultimately that is going to benefit us but i also think that's where you're now seeing much more um like crackdowns around control on social media they're trying to ban things stop things you can't talk about this you can't do this try you know like for example you had your uh, youtube channel pulled down really quickly I think that we're going to see more and more censorship and we're going to see the deliberate manipulation around what what is and what isn't free speech because people are learning now. And I actually think TikTok and YouTube have got a big stake in this. TikTok and YouTube are so pro like around like, um, you know, like people connecting and talking about things that they wouldn't normally talk about, like the, the building of communities around new ideas. Those two platforms in particular are really powerful for that. So I think that we'll probably see more and more control of that, especially around psychiatry, I think, and uh, medicine and and stuff, because it's going to make people very uncomfortable. Russell Brand is the other personality out of the UK. He's very mm-hmm. popular in the United States, and he's speaking about these exact issues around uh, oppression and censorship and really starting to challenge institutions that I think we all agree have to go through a radical transformation in order to be able to advance our society. And so that, that takes me into kind of, you know, what your work is, but I I do want to also mention your, the UK is the Royal college of psychiatrists. Like that's another interesting institution. They just recently had their conference. And so there's this critical psych movement that certainly comes out of the UK where some people are actually just recording their presentations and one you know some two things that came out of onto social media and into the United States here in our culture was one you had a psychiatrist who admitted that he provides antidepressant medication drugs to an elderly population even yeah. though there's no evidence to support it just to try to um i think pr- provoke the placebo response yeah, so he admitted yeah. that mm-hmm. that got caught on video yeah. And then they've been trying to defend against the ideas of Mark Horowitz and Joanna Moncrief without actually inviting them. And their psychiatrists or in that academic mm-hmm. world without even inviting them to have that discussion. And then the yeah. third thing, which is really critical to your work, is they're actually trying to defend the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And yeah. they tried to distort this idea of the disorder in comparison to what complex trauma would be. And they ignored that somebody who's been traumatized, whether it's abuse or neglect or lifelong struggles in relationships, that we are relational beings, that somehow if if you had the if you experience complex trauma, you wouldn't have problems in relationships around safety or security or fear of abandonment, mm-hmm. you know, was, or identity development problems it was just absolutely insanity that they're trying to hold on to some of these horrifically stupid ideas around <laughs> category, categorizing people with these disorders. It's a they're not going to let go. They're not going to let go with any. Uh, grace that's not going to happen they are going to go down fighting but that's because for I think personally that's a number of things like first of all we have entire as you know we have entire systems built around these so-called diagnosis and disorders Um, identities are built around them people's careers are built around them university departments are built around them you know 
to then admit that there's probably not a good enough evidence base for any of what we've been doing for many years. And not only has the evidence base never been there, but we've, I think that there's been active deceit. I think there's been lying. I think there's been twisting of information. I think there's been deliberate sort of um, misuse of data. Um, There's been the misogyny. There's been the racism that's been involved. There's been the homophobia that's always been there. I think that when you talk about radical transformation, for me, I'm, I don't know if psychiatry can be radically transformed. I think that it ha- would have to be completely deconstructed. I think it would have to be broken down completely because so much of it lacks an evidence base that I don't know what would be left of it really. You know, like we know that there is no genetic basis. Where there's no, you know, the American Psychiatric Association admits that there's no gene been found for a single psychiatric disorder. We know that there's no brain chemical imbalances. We know we can't test them. We've never been able to generate um, a diagnostic test for a single psychiatric disorder in existence. All we have is um, psychometrics and self-report questionnaires. You know, we're going around deliberately sharing misinformation. You've got doctors telling their patients, oh, you have a serotonin imbalance. Take these pills. It'll make you feel better without ever actually testing whether there is one. There's so much myth. There's so many social sort of lies and messages. I don't know what would be left of psychiatry if we actually stripped it of all of that almost like uh, fiction and all of its fairy tales. If you take everything out of it and go, right, what have you got left? You've got very little.